welcome to All About Puzzle Blocks. I'm Rachel. I'm a theatrical milliner based in Central North Carolina in the United States. And I want to start the stream by saying thank you to my chat moderator by Ilona Millinery. Uh, Ilona is a contemporary milliner based in London who also has a YouTube channel with primarily millinery content, um, tutorials, and equipment demonstrations and product trials and all kinds of exciting millinery focused content. So definitely check out her channel. I've linked it in the description to this stream and thank you Alona so much for moderating the chat today. We're going to be talking all about puzzle blocks and that's not to uh, claim that I know all about puzzle blocks. I do own four puzzle blocks which we'll be looking at today in the course of this stream and I will try to answer any questions that you might have. Please ask them in the chat um, or if you're seeing this after the fact because this video will post to YouTube and can be accessed later if you're not able to attend in the moment. Um, and you have questions, ask them in the comments there and I'll be answering the questions that I know the answers to, but I also want to encourage any of you who uh, want to join the discussion, who know answers to things people ask or uh, have input, please put it in the chat. I, I would love for this to be a conversation uh, rather than a lecture. And Ilona, who is moderating the chat, I know that she owns two puzzle blocks uh, so she may know some of the answers to questions that you have because she has some as well. Um, and that's the first thing that I want to cover is the answer to the question, what is a puzzle block? Because I think, I, I hope most of you know about the process of hat blocking, forming felt and straw hat bodies over hat blocks. Um, but what makes a puzzle block different from a standard hat block? And I have uh, some visual aids here to show you. And let's take a look, starting with this hat. This is a traditionally blocked hat that was made on this set of blocks here. And you're probably familiar with crown blocks and brim blocks. And so this is a crown block. It's got a Hamburg, a Hamburg kind of crease in the top. And this is the brim block that I used with this crown block. Let me put them back together here um, to form this hat. And I have these as a visual aid here to show you how easily, like even though this is a finished hat, I've trimmed it out, I've put a, a headband grow grain inside of here and a little maker's label, and it still fits back on this block easily. I can display it on here if I want to. Um, and that is sort of the key to what makes a puzzle block different from a standard block like this. I, I also, let me rewind a minute here. I'm using terms that are specific to American milliners, and I know that uh, millinery vocabulary varies across uh, not just English-speaking countries, but around the globe. We call things different words. Uh, you know, I would call this an, a Hamburg-style hat, and I would love it if, if you call it something different where you live, to put that in the chat, like, oh, we call that such and such in the Netherlands or in South Africa um, or wherever you're joining us from. Uh, that is to say that I will just tell you when, a, ta when a, a word that I use is specific to U.S. milliners. And if you know it as something else, jump in and let us know, because I would love to know more words uh, globally for tools of our trade and styles of millinery. And so back to what I was saying, we are looking at traditionally blocked hats and how this shape, which comes so easily on and off this block or pair of blocks, differs from this shape. And this hat, this is my millinery model, Zelda. And behind me here is another one of my millinery mannequins, Mavis, who's wearing a beautiful spiral straw 
uh, low crown topper, but that's, I'm digressing. Um, <laughs> this shape is blocked on a puzzle block and without, ha I own the block that this was made on and made this hat, but even if I just saw this in a vintage store or on a runway, I would know that this was made on a puzzle block. And the reason why, let me give you a little 360 view of this hat. And you can see how many complex curves are part of the structure of this shape. You know, we have concave curves at the back here and swooping uh, bulbous part of the sort of beret-like shape that forms the front plane of the hat here, but this weird section juts out like this and there's a deep undercut right here along the shape of this block. And that's what lets me know that it is a puzzle block because, you know, I was able to take that hat, the Homburg, on and off of these blocks really easily. And how would I even get this hat off of this hat block Unless instead of taking the block, the hat off the block, I could take the block out of the hat once I'd blocked it. And that's really the key of what makes a puzzle block. Uh, it's called a puzzle block in America because it's composed of multiple pieces. I, I'm going to show you a two piece puzzle block. Uh, I, I know that three, four, five piece puzzle blocks exist. I've never seen one more than five pieces, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist out there. Um, three of the ones we'll look at today are five piece blocks and I'll show you a two piece block as well. This comes off of a five piece hat block and it's entirely because we couldn't get it off of a block that was only one piece, like it'd be trapped on there. And in fact, if you uh, know anything about casting with molds, uh, which is, uh, like I said, I'm a theatrical milliner and a craftsperson, and not only do I make hats for the stage, but I also make a lot of other costume pieces for the stage. And sometimes we cast either uh, ornaments that, that go onto something like, say, a piece of a breastplate, an armor breastplate, or we cast a performer's face because we're going to make a mask that fits very close to the face. And one of the terms that we use in casting, uh, when you have a mold that you can't get the cast out of because it's got too many undercuts, is that the, the mold and the cast are locked together. And if I were to try to block this on a traditional block, my hat would be locked onto the block. I wouldn't be able to get it off. But the first demonstration that I want to do is before this stream, I blocked this hat body, this is felt, um, on this same block that Zelda's lovely hat is made out of. And I'm going to take this hat off the block to show you how you do that. And I guess here I should, let me get my blocking pins. And ooh, there's thunder. I don't know if you heard that, but we're scheduled for a pretty serious rainstorm here today in this, the Carolina Piedmont. So um, I, you may hear thunder in the audio to this video. I hope that it's not going to impact my streamability, but if I cut out, um, well, you know, it's, it's out of my hands. <laughs> I'm gonna take the pins out of the ropes that I've used to block this hat body on the puzzle block that Zelda's hat was made on to show you how I'm gonna get it out of there, how I'm gonna get the block out of the, the blocked hat body. And now is a good time, I guess, uh, to mention that I could be wrong here, but every one of my puzzle blocks needs to be blocked on a hood or a cone, which is the, the words for felt hat bodies uh, that we use in America. And I have one here. What differentiates this from other styles of felt hat bodies that you can buy is 
it's the narrowness of the shape. You know, it doesn't flare out at the base, which I have also what's called a flare here. But you can see how this one flares out at the base in a way that this hood doesn't. And it's not to say that you can't use a flare to block a puzzle block. I've actually done that before. Uh, one type of hat body that I don't think that you could use without it being a, a whole lot of um, steam and pressure and difficulty is these cartwheels, uh, also called capelines or cape lines depending on where you learned the term. Um, I think I've heard Alona use the term capeline in her videos. Um, I call them capelines, and I've also heard them called cartwheels. So please chime in if you call them something else. But the, the property of this that doesn't work on a puzzle block is the way that it's formed with this wide brim that flares out so substantially once you get past the crown of the block. You know, all of these puzzle blocks are really complex shapes with um, interesting topography and undercuts that make it so that they have to be puzzle blocks, but they're not brimmed shapes, at least not any of the ones that I have found are they brim shapes where a capoline would be advantageous to use? I think you'd have to cut it down and maybe use what you cut off of it. I, I, I still think there would actually be too much material in the felt of the brim where, it's, where it flares out in this type of hat body, which is to say that I personally have always used hoods. And if I couldn't find a hood in the right color or material that I wanted, then uh, a flare. All right, I've pulled everything off of this block except for this one remaining rope that I need to loosen the slip knot on and take it off of here. And then I'll show you how this comes apart. Put my blocking tacks away here. So when you look at the bottom of this, this one is different from the puzzle block that Alona demonstrated in her stream, which I also linked in the description to this video if you want to watch it after the fact. She's using a couple of different blocks and only one is a puzzle block. Um, but I noticed in her stream that hers didn't have this big base, which all of mine have. I, I, that's a, a structural difference that is probably a preference of the block maker. So you see I've just pulled, oop, I've got two pieces that came out. Just pulled these two pieces whoop, out of the hat shape. And now you see in here, like that's what allows us to have all of the undercut topography that we have in this hat shape is because I can pull these five pieces out of here without mangling the hat shape in a way that I can't correct after the fact. You know, uh, I think I blocked a hat in a, a, a video, a vlog, where I blocked a seagrass straw hood on a vintage 1940s block that I was worried I wasn't going to be able to get it off of it because it had a little bit of undercut um, but not at the center back and I was able to shift it and and because I used an open weave seagrass straw it had enough give that I could get it out of there and now well, my lighting is so crappy right now. I, I spent a lot of time working on the lighting of this video. Um, oh, there we got some good light. Okay, I, I spent so much time working on the lighting of this video this morning. Um, and then it got overcast. And then this horrible th storm started happening. Oh, you know, actually, I could adjust these blinds and maybe get some more light. Uh,
it's not really hugely better, is it? Um, but you can see that we have a double rope line here from where I blocked this. And when I finish this hat, well, honestly, I'm not going to finish this hat. I, I blocked this for the stream to be able to demonstrate how you take a felt hat body off of a complex puzzle block. And really, I'm just going to steam this and put it back into my hat body stock. Uh, but if I were going to finish this hat, I'd be cutting it along this bottom rope line that you see on the block here and folding it up in there to uh, be the head size opening of the hat. So, you know, I, I would trim this along this bottom rope line all the way along here. And that would be how I'd finish this hat. Now, as I said, I'm not going to finish it. Um, but this one has this double rope line there. And in this hat, I've already lined it and everything. Um, feeling this edge, you know, you can see on this block, this double rope line gives you about a five eighths of an inch. I, I honestly don't know what this is in metric. And I'm sure that many of you in European nations and actually everywhere else in the world, America is really back, backward in terms of the units of measurement that we use. Um, but I sort of imagine this to be five eighths of an inch, which um, is kind of like maybe a centimeter and a half, two centimeters um, that is folded up inside of here and gave me something um, to stabilize this edge that I've stitched my lining and my grow grain to in there. And that is this lovely puzzle block that I'm gonna put this hat back on Zelda here. This one, a, a question that I saw popping up in um, every discussion that I was able to find online about puzzle blocks, um, and also in the comments uh, on Alona's video where she blocked on a puzzle block, people were asking where you could buy these. And to my knowledge, no contemporary block maker offers puzzle blocks as a standard type of block you can buy from them. They have all kinds of fancy, lovely shapes. Um, but, and I would love to be proven wrong about that. If you know of anywhere that sells puzzle blocks now on a retail basis, please mention it in the chat or the comments to this video. Um, that's not to say that I don't think you could find a block maker that would allow you to commission a puzzle block. I don't know. Um, I've never commissioned one. I've always lucked into getting them. And the other three that we'll be looking at in, ad in addition to this one, I won on eBay. Um, and uh, a couple of my graduate students, you know, I've been teaching for 16 years now at the graduate program, the MFA program at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And um, I got my first puzzle block when I started that job. And I think I've had a couple of students who were really taken by puzzle blocks because they're such beautiful artifacts of the trade. Like they're, they're works of art in and of themselves. And they're really cool. Like once you see the, the way that they're engineered, like many people are really drawn to them. And so I've had a couple of students really begin to be block collectors after taking my class. And um, all of them won their blocks on eBay auctions. Now, I think that's becoming less and less of a place that you can find them affordably because they are so rare. Um, and you can also find them on Etsy. But um, this one, I'm super excited about this one. Um, I just love this shape. I got it at a liquidation sale of a millinery company uh, that in New York City that was going out of business and they were selling off loads of millinery supplies and equipment and tools and blocks. And the, the sale was not widely advertised to the public or anything. It was promoted by invitation and by word of mouth among U.S. millinery uh, communities and people flew from all over the country. I mean, maybe all over the world. I don't know. The people I met there 
uh, either lived in New York City or had come there from elsewhere. I flew from North Carolina. And um, this block was on, in the block room. They had a whole section, a whole room of blocks. And um, I was authorized to buy, um, I say I was authorized, I, I was able to buy only one block. I had budgeted to buy only one block. And this is the block that I got, which, you know, I, I believe that this block is from the 1940s. And the reason I believe that is just because I um, am familiar with the style lines of millinery fashions from that period. I think it's late 1940s, possibly on the cusp of the 1950s. If you have a different theory, I'd love to hear it. Please put it in the chat. Also, I, I want to say hi to um, Denise Wallace Spriggs, who is uh, a mi millinery mentor of mine. I noticed she said hi in the chat. Um, and also hi to Susan Mai, who um, said hello in the chat. Um, if you have other thoughts on when, because I don't know, you know, there wasn't any date printed on this thing. And I know that in Alona's stream, she found a, a maker's mark on her block that gave, and an address, I believe, in Paris that gave her some idea of the provenance I don't have any way of estimating how old this block is beyond just my knowledge of millinery fashion history and analyzing the shape for what I think was trendy at that time. And to me, especially this view right here is what makes me think late 1940s. Um, but that's the first of four blocks that I want to talk about. I projected that this stream would last about an hour just to give you uh, a, a benchmark for planning there. Um, here in North Carolina, it is currently, uh, let me get one of these other blocks up here. Here in North Carolina, it is 1130. It's going on lunchtime. Um, I believe if you're joining us from like Australia, Thank you so much because it's late night there. I had people RSVP from all over the globe, so I really don't know where everyone's from. Um, but if you need to pop out and and if we, I, I want to stay long enough to answer all the questions that people have. Um, but if you need to leave, like I said, the stream will be posted to YouTube afterwards. So you can just bow out and, and catch the rest of it later. This is the second puzzle block that I want to show you. And I don't have a hat from this one to show you, uh, to compare. There's a, a link to a blog post in the description to this screen, stream slash recording um, of, I had two students choose to make hats on this block. Not the last time I taught millinery, or the last time, but the time before that. So um, that blog post is from my old blog back on Live Journal, back when Live Journal was a thing. And um, I had two people choose to use this one. And this one is an excellent example of a type of block that I call a telescopic block because you could block this shape I think you get better light over here because of the way that the light is going thanks to this horrible thunderstorm which has thrown a wrench in things but um, you see that the double rope lines on this one start here and when when you look at this you can imagine the hat that like the brim you could block this hat and cut the brim here and have that be the hat. But the intent of the block designer was that you would block it all the way down to these rope lines here. And this brim would fold back on itself. This would all pop up inside of here. And this double rope line section would be 
the head size opening that was against your head when you're wearing the hat. And the brim, instead of having a raw cut edge, like this, that's the way I chose to finish the brim edge on this Homburg that I blocked, was I just cut it raw. And I actually have a video about four different ways to finish blocked uh, the brims of felt hats. And cutting it raw is one way to do it. And you could block this, cut it raw here, but that they made this block so you could have this fold blocked into it and fold that back up inside itself. If you look at the block, or uh, excuse me, if you look at the blog post in which the two different students blocked hats on this puzzle block, um, you'll see that they manipulated the felt after it came off the block in two different ways to get two slightly different styles of hat from this block, which I think is something that's pretty exciting about this block and about these telescopic blocks in general, where there is some feature to the way the block has been carved that gives you a clue to how you, as the milliner, are supposed to finish the hat, or a way that you can elect to finish the hat. I, I don't like to speak in absolutes because one of the cool things about millinery as a craft is that you, as the milliner, always can choose to uh, manipulate the felt or the buckram or the straw in whatever way you choose. And so this is an option that this block gives you is to fold that back up, in, back up inside there, and this telescopic puzzle block feature. And I have another hat back here, which I don't have the block that it came off of, but um, it came off of a similar telescopic block. That. I have it back here this little hat, which this came off of a puzzle block that one of my graduate students bought, I guess back in 2008 or nine, probably, uh, Candy McLernan. And the block, like now you can see it has this pork pie crown where there's the, the dome of the crown is, is pushed down inside of here really. And you can hand shape these pork pie crown divots. Um, but this was made on a telescopic puzzle block. And I'm gonna pop it back out so that you can see what it looks like when it came off the block. The block itself had that divot crown raised up and it was only after you take it off the block that you could pop it back in and see what the intended shape was. I mean, you could leave it unpopped, but um, I chose to pop it back in there. And uh, this is the hat style. So that's the, the, the first type, uh, the first feature of puzzle blocks that I wanted to address is that telescopic. Uh, brim on this one or tele telescopic raised crown that can be divoted back in itself and actually that was um, one of the things that the graduate students one of them who worked on this puzzle block here you'll notice that there's some dimension to the crown here where there's an undercut. And this area here, where that, you can't see it as well against my shirt, but stay, leave it like this, you can see it well. This undercut here, one of the students folded that down so that the shape became more, um, dimensional at the front. You had a little pucker and a fold at the front. And the other one left it sort of like this raised up macaron. Ah, 
this raised up French macaron sort of shape to it. Ooh, that's a good idea for how you could use this block, make a hat that is inspired by French macarons. Anyway, um, I think that, or I have seen my own students interpret the, the planes of this block in a couple of different ways, which is interesting and exciting. Questions are not popping up in the chat, so I'm just going to keep showing you different puzzle blocks. And this one here, there's a couple of aspects to this block that I, I want to show you. Um, again, as like none of these are... Um, features that you'll find in every puzzle blog, but they're features that you may notice and are interesting to know about. I find them interesting as someone who's just um, enthused about millinery history. Push Zelda out of the way here so we can see this a little better. Um, yeah, let's get her totally out of the view. So, Remember that pork pie crown hat that had what I described as a telescopic uh, topography to the puzzle block that allowed that crown to be raised up and then popped back in. This one is designed to have the same pork pie crown tip, but it achieves it in a different way structurally. And that's with a tip press and this you may be familiar with these from contemporary crown blocks particularly um, some fedora blocks have these and some pork pie blocks have these where the goal is to use the tip press to press the hat body down in a divot or a, a ridged shape on the block um, just so that after you block it and you put the tip press in there and you press it like either you clamp it or the student who used this block to make a hat for my class once piled up a huge stack of heavy books on top here to get it to press down in there um, and and that's something that you may find on uh, puzzle blocks, but also standard blocks that have divots in the crown that they want you to uh, be able to control. And that is what this is, a tip press. This block has a couple of other features that I want to highlight. And one of them is, do you see this latch here? a little hook and eye sort of latch hook and there's another one on the other side and that is a feature that I added to this block after I saw it on a puzzle block that one of my students purchased I believe it was Randy Handley that purchased a puzzle block that had these hooks on it and I was like that is a brilliant innovation and the reason why is because on these five piece puzzle blocks where you have two pieces on the sides that slide, that one hazard of, of the engineering of these blocks is that if that latch is not engaged, when you pick it up, that bottom and all of the pieces can drop out. And Actually, I've, I've had one student buy a puzzle block on eBay, pick it up by the sides, and it drop out and actually cracked on the floor, and we had to clamp it back together and glue it with wood glue, which is a tragedy. But if you have these hooks engaged, let me get them engaged. I just installed these literally like two hours before this stream. Um, 
But once the hooks are engaged, when you pick the block up, it doesn't fall apart. And that's really a, an excellent feature if you are uh, working in a shop with a lot of assistants and you don't want someone to accidentally pick up the block, damage it, and then it becomes something that they feel super guilty about and you need to, to you know, reassure them as you fix it. Um, it's, it's just a, a safety feature that I thought was really an excellent um, addition, which is why I installed them on this block and also another one that I'm gonna show you. Ideally, I wanna put these on every one of my blocks. I need to do some research into what's the best hook uh, hardware because um, I just put these in before this and I think I need to do some adjustments to make sure that the, the latch hook really functions where, best. Um, and that maybe the, the hook that was on Randy's block was a different style of hardware. And it's, there's a close up of it in the blog post in the description to this video, um, one of the two blog posts that are linked, if you'd like to see it. And um, so I'd like to install these on all my puzzle blocks because I don't want someone to accidentally drop them all over the floor, break them, and then feel really upset about it. Um, another feature of this block that I want you to see, do you see that newsprint in there? which actually I, I should analyze this newsprint and see if I could find a date on it because I believe that this shape is mid-century, late 50s, early 60s, but I could be wrong. And, and what I wanna talk about right now though is this newsprint that's in here because it's not on all four of my puzzle blocks, but these newsprint layers that are adhered to the sections of the block are a feature of several of my puzzle blocks and you know when I first bought them I wondered what's what's going on there um, and I actually um, on that same blog post where you can see the hooks on Randy's block there's in the comments I had a whole uh, conversation thread with one of my blog readers who's a milliner in uh, Barcelona, Spain, Cristina de Prada. And Cristina is a really talented milliner. Um, we talked about what the possible reason is for this um, newsprint to be glued into the panels of this hat of these puzzle blocks and I'll say right now I don't know I have not spoken to anyone who was a uh, hat block maker at the time that these things were being manufactured so this is just conjecture but my theory was that the block makers would carve these blocks all in one and then slice them up and install the architecture of these grooves and slides on the inside here after the blocks had been fully sculpted and um, that the newsprint was put on there to sort of fill the space. Like if you cut this, once you have this thing carved, if you then saw it apart with like a bandsaw, you'll lose a little bit of material in there and that maybe by, uh, with the principle of paper mache, that maybe you'd be putting the, um, the newsprint in there to just take up that space that was opened up by the saw blade when you cut it into pieces, and also to return the quality of the wood to a, a smoothness because this has to slide smoothly down in here and it all has to smooth, has to slide smoothly apart once they, once you've blocked a hat on it. 
And so I thought, oh, maybe that's why they put it in there was to reduce the, the, um, the drag uh, on the surfaces when you slide them apart and to take up the space so you don't have as significant of a crack in there. Um, particularly thinking that these were made uh, for hat styles in a time when felt hat bodies came at such a wide range of weights and that somebody might be using a tissue felt or something very delicate, um, fur felts and, and so forth, where you might see those cracks if they were larger. Um, which actually, I think um, in Alona's stream about puzzle blocks, she had a block that the central piece um, had dropped a little bit because hat blocks, wood ones, are affected by temperature and humidity. And the wood expands and contracts at different rates. And when you certainly have a five piece block, they don't all respond to the temperature and the humidity in the same way. And Alona's block had, had lost some height in the central piece. And there was, I think maybe she made it, maybe the person she bought it from or the maker made it, a little piece of felt that smoothed it out. It's sort of like um, a, a plug that went on the top so that you could block on it and it would be even. You wouldn't have this registration of a difference in distance. So that was my theory to go back to the, the newsprint and why is it there. But Christina had heard, and I think this is so fascinating, Christina had heard that puzzle blocks were cut up into the puzzle pieces before they were carved, that, that the, the block maker would stack up wood to, uh, let's see if you can see it on one of these. No, I do have a, a block where you can see the layers. Maybe it's this one. Oh, yes. So where you can see that the, this is a lighter type of wood than this, and, and there's a seam there. And the block maker would stack up these layers of wood, which I'm, I'm, I know nothing about woodworking here. Um, so please chime in if you know anything different or to add to this. They'd st stack up the layers and then they'd cut it into the puzzle pieces and then glue it back together in order to then turn and carve it. Again, credit to Christina de Prada who heard this or knew of this. And that, that when they cut it up and then glued it back together, that's when the newsprint would come into it was they would use it to make those glue surfaces sturdy enough to withstand the carving process, but that they could be easily separated again once the shape was carved so that you could then, the block maker could then route out these grooves or attach on these uh, runners. And I like that idea. I, again, I don't know enough about woodworking to judge whether any of these theories has uh, more merit than the others. And I don't know anyone personally with an extensive hat block carving experience to ask their opinion as well. I've had some hat blocks carved for me from woodworkers here in North Carolina, uh, but they're traditional woodworkers who don't uh, typically, custom, who don't typically carve hat blocks. So I, you know, I could ask their opinion, but I don't think that they, it, it, I don't think they'd have the same body of knowledge that a block maker would have, someone who had made dozens or hundreds of hat blocks in their careers. So um, that is another question out there, I guess. I have so many questions to answer about hat blocks and, and I'm hoping uh, that some of you might know the answers or that people who watch the video of this stream after it completes may chime in. I'd love to hear from hat block makers their thoughts on the, the presence of newsprint inside these uh, puzzle blocks. 
This one is also a good example um, of another feature that I have noticed in not all of my blocks, but some of them. And I see this in blocks where there's at least some aspect of symmetricality to the design of the hat. And that is, can you see these little zeros that are stamped into the pieces around that section where three pieces come together? That is there as a code from the black from the block maker to the milliner as to how you put this together once you block a hat on it and then you take all the pieces out and I know this from experience that you think you can just put it right back together and that should be intuitive and frankly it's not um, it's very easy to to put it back together wrong and especially if you were you know if if you have invested in a style that requires a puzzle block such that you've purchased one of these. They're not cheap. I imagine, I don't know how much they cost originally, but they're hat blocks, especially custom hat blocks in, in um, stylish shapes are always more expensive than like a standard crown block or, a, you know, a, a brim block that is pretty... Uh, that, that you can use for a lot of different purposes because they're such unique styles. And what happens when they go out of style, you retire the block and you know you, you have only a, a short tail of, of time to make money off your investment. So if you have a big enough millinery studio where you have puzzle blocks, uh, you probably have at least a couple of milliners assistants helping you out. And that zero code in the crowns or in the on the block pieces that zero code uh, allows anyone who knows the secret to it to to put the block back together without let me put this one back together wrong so you would think this is so symmetrical of course it's going to go back together um, Except, no, if you get these pieces oriented wrong, like, you see this here? This, this piece doesn't want to go on that slider. I mean, I can make it go on that slider, but I still have a break in this ridge right here. And if I put it back together the right way, according to the zero code, this is an old block. So it's got a certain amount of damage just from age, uh, like this little divot in the ridge right here. Um, but I have had students successfully make hats on this block by using paper clay to sort of fill that in. Um, but, you know, this is as good as this block goes back together at this point in its life. And that zero code helps me put it back together quickly, put it back on the shelf, and, and not have to spend even a, a, a small amount of time putting it on and putting the pieces on and going, oh, that's not correct, and having to redo it. So that's... An excellent feature and I have eight minutes to 12 and I have one more block to show you all so let me put this back here and this one is a two-piece puzzle block which this one also has the little hook latch here because your instinct is to pick this up by this whoo, weird little pom-pom ball on the top. And that's the problem with this latch is if it lets go, it drops, right? Sorry about that loud noise. 
This one is carved in balsa wood, and which is a really soft wood. And this shape, I think, is very 1960s. I have seen other hats blocked with this strange little pom-pom area in the center of the hat. And they've been finished with sprays of feathers. So you got kind of a, a almost like a feather ponytail shooting up around this shape that was hidden in the middle there. Um, which gives me kind of a clue as to how some mill owners might have chosen to make a hat blocked on this block. And this one is only two pieces, which again, I don't have a hat to show you that has been blocked on this one. Um, in theatrical millinery, you don't have a lot of choice about the hats that you make because you need to make the hats that the costume designer wants created for the production. And sometimes they will draw those hats as part of their costume design renderings or provide you with a bunch of research. I have also worked with designers who knew that I um, enjoyed millinery and had an extensive block collection and would want to look at the blocks that we have in our block library and choose one. And so far, I have not made a block on this for a show. Primarily what I've used this for is to block Buckram and Foss shape only over this little round area to make eyeballs for mascot costumes, like for the, the heads of mascots, those big creature heads where we needed little buggy eyes. Um, well, not little, big buggy eyes. So um, that's how I have used this myself. Um, but I can tell by looking at it, and, and you should be able to, to look at this and sort of evaluate now that you've seen a hat and the block that it came off of. You should be able to look at this and see how you're able to have only one piece or only two pieces to this puzzle block because if you have a hat body on here if you can slide it and get just this part out and then pop this forward and pull it out of the hat body that that's all you need and as much as i like the multi-piece puzzle blocks you you don't if the shape doesn't need more than two or three pieces like there's no reason to make five pieces just because you can um or at least that's that's my philosophy and as we look at this block it's interesting to me be, to to evaluate how it's been made because you have one piece of wood that's glued together here that's not the seam where the block comes apart. So thinking about how the block maker created this one is really interesting. I think in this case, they had to stack up their wood block and there's no, there's no newsprint in here uh, to confirm or corroborate or uh, disprove Christina's theory that that would be something that was cut up before they carved the block. Um, if they did that as a matter of practice, they didn't do it here. If block makers did that, I'm not sure that all block makers made these all the same way, but um, that is a fascinating question that requires more inquiry, I guess. Let me look at my list of things I meant to cover in this. Tip press. Zero key. The zero code. Uh, telescope blocks. Newsprint. Mache. Oh, 
there's one more aspect of this block, which I'll tell you we're two minutes to noon. And, um, but I, I want to show you this third, this last thing that is in progress. Um, that's pretty exciting that this block relates to this block. And it's this here, which this is, I have a graduate student who's very interested in using uh, 3D fabrication technologies to preserve and replicate and reproduce um, these antique millinery tools. And um, Athena Wright, she uh, took this block and 3D scanned the pieces. And then actually I, I'll have to ask her because I think she 3D scanned the whole thing put together and then cut it up because the this block comes apart at a different angle from this block. But the idea was, um, and there's a, an article linked in the description to the screen, stream if you'd like to read more about it, that um, Athena and I for, for several years have had this ongoing research about scanning, 3D scanning, Ex existent blocks and in the case of the article we scanned a vintage hat and she reverse engineered the block that it would have been made on just from a scan of the hat and so I think this one she scanned the block and was looking at possibilities for 3d printing the pieces of a puzzle block uh, because if you could take a block like this and turn it into a digital scan file that then you you sell the, maybe the scan of the block on Etsy. Yeah, that's my alarm telling me that it's noon and the stream should be over. Um, but I want to finish this thought. Um, that if you could scan the block, and then I could like I could send a scan of this block to Alona in London, and she could print a version of this block or have it machined with a CDC router, and that would be a way that we could preserve and, and replicate and share and reproduce um, blocks that it's not feasible. Like I'm, I, I'm not gonna take this block to England. Um, Alona's probably not gonna get, a plane, get on a plane and fly to the US just to make a hat on this hat block. But if she wanted to, that the eventual goal of our research is to come up with ways that these blocks could be shared digitally. Um, that's what this is. And we printed this one in PLA, PLA plastic at 50% uh, scale, just because this was a, a trial, this was early in the research, and um, we wanted to figure out how dense the, the plastic should be printed at, because you can choose to have, um, they call it infill, and 100% infill is totally solid, but there are pockets of air. The more infill you add, the lighter weight the piece is. And so this was just a, in the interest of conserving media and printing um, this test prototype at a smaller scale so we weren't just wasting filament. Uh, because we do all this stuff in the maker spaces at our university, and you don't want to, you know, use more filament than you have to when you might get halfway through the print or you might print only one piece and discover something that's totally wrong with it. Um, anyway, it's a, a conservation choice, I guess. Um, and that actually comes to the conclusion of what I wanted to share and discuss in this puzzle block stream. I would love it if you have uh, topics and ideas for future streams and webinars of this sort that you'd like to see. Uh, drop those in the chat, or uh, if you're watching this after the fact, leave them in a comment to this video. Uh, because I have uh, so many exciting ideas for things I'd love to cover in streams uh, in the future. But I don't want to make videos that nobody wants to watch. I don't want to host streams that no one wants to attend. 
So please comment and let me know if you have uh, requests for future streams. Again, I want to thank Ilona by Ilona Millinery so much for moderating my chat today, which um, I highly suggest that you go check out her, ch her channel. It's fantastic and fun, and she has a lot of great content. And I'm going to go ahead and switch this to a stream ending uh, slide. But uh, I will let the stream ending slide play for another minute in case you have any further questions or comments or suggestions for further streams. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've loved sharing these antique blocks from my collection with you and uh, would love to hear about your experiences. Oh wait, one last thing. So I mentioned you can get these blocks on eBay and Etsy, but 